Hello? Like, can you all hear me okay? Ahoy, ahoy. Yay, hi, sugar. Great, sorry about the technical difficulty if you were in the other link. Um, I didn't set up the... I didn't set up the scheduler properly, and so it wasn't letting me just go live. Yay. Okay, sound works. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to wait just another minute or two uh, while people uh, kind of file in and find, <laughs> and find the live stream. This is the first YouTube live stream I've ever done, and I wasn't expecting it to be as complicated as it was. I don't know. Um, but just, I guess, while we're all waiting, I guess, typical, uh, typical icebreaker stuff, let me know in the chat where you're calling in from and um, what era you're planning on working on for the cloak along and Team hand sew or team machine sew? Important, important questions. Uh, and if you have any questions for me, um, let me know also in the chat if you have questions that you would like me to uh, answer during this time. Woohoo, West Coast. Nice, some West Coasters. 1850s. Machine sewing. Awesome. Very cool. 18th century English hand sewing broadcloth. Cool. Hi, Rebecca. Um, sweet. Dallas, Fort Worth. Nice. Colorado, New Jersey, 1630s. Musketeers. Yay. 18th century Regency hand sew. SoCal, still not sure, mix, hand sewing, machine sewing, Oregon, cool, 18th century, more 18th century, 1880s or 1890s, awesome, combination, cool, um, I'm going to talk about what I'm going to make a little bit later, but I'm doing both machine and hand sewing as well. Um, and for those of you who don't know, I'm uh, in a suburb of Denver, Colorado. So Colorado here. Sweet. We have a bunch of people. All right. Yay. Thank you all for coming. This is so exciting. Um, I'm really excited to do this so long that I have a lot. I have a lot planned. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about some of that as well. I maybe should have brought myself a copy of the schedule <laughs> just so I don't mess any of that up. So uh, the uh, pattern roundup was kind of huge. I was not expecting that many patterns at all. Um, that was a lot of patterns. And there's ones that are not on that list. Um, but some people were sort of uh, hedging on, didn't know what to pick. And so I thought I would give like a short list of, of like, hey, if you need to be pointed in a direction, here's some good direction to go in. Um, I'm going to start with 18th century because that's kind of where I tend to live most often. Um, and I'll pull some things. My number one recommendation is this which I think is probably backwards for you, but this is costume close-up. Um, there are essentially three patterns in this book that would fall under the category of cloaks. And um, they're based on extants that are in the collection at Colonial Williamsburg, which is really cool. And there's lots of like good info, like they'll tell you about fabric and uh, what stitches were used and what kind of thread they used and what the fabric is like and uh, original fabric widths and all kinds of like fun tricks and tips. 
Oh, perfect. Um, so I'm actually going to be making oh, wrong page. I'm going to be making this one, which I think is the one uh, that Rebecca said she just that she made. Um, and they give you they're not gridded, but they're uh, they do have measurements. So you can figure out uh, how to use these patterns. And there is also a men's cloak in here. And there aren't as many men's patterns out there, which I was expecting. But um, where are you? Uh, this is the men's cloak. So you can see the differences in styles. It's a little longer. It has a like a more visible collar and uh, capes at the top. Ooh, I do not know about the speculation about the hood piecing, Rebecca. Let me let me know that it's not. No, oh, I want to know. Um, the hood is in a multitude of pieces, though. I do know that. And I do know that the lining was replaced. The women's cloak has a hood lining and it has essentially a facing along the fronts and they were replaced. Uh... Oh, interesting. The lining was replaced in the fifties when the cloak entered the collection at the Colonial, Colonial Williamsburg by the conservator. Um, but uh, they do believe that the way it is lined is the way it was lined in the original um, as a partial lining and not a full lining. Most cloaks in the 18th century were not lined uh, unless there was some other reason for doing that. So uh, Rebecca said that the, the hood piecing is a pain and it was a fix for a mistake. And just so you guys can kind of see what the hood pattern piece looks like. So these are pieces. There's like three pieces. Um, Crystal, what part of the 19th century are you referring to? Yes, Sue Felshin's website is on the pattern website, pattern website, the pattern spreadsheet. And there, uh, she talks specifically about short cloaks and there's a ton of information on her website. And I believe that she recently updated her website as well. So a lot of her links and things should work where I think they were kind of broken for a little while. Just the links being out of date, not um, that there was anything wrong with the website. And then in the third one in this book is a lace mantelette, uh, which has a really fun shape. Uh, which would be good for uh, ladies of leisure and also warm weather because I believe it was a thing that you did not go out without something over your shoulders. So this would have been something you might have worn to show off conspicuous consumption because that lace would probably have been expensive, but also to not overheat. Uh, so that is my 18th century... Uh, prim the other thing I'm going to say is that books seem to be a little bit price inflated right now. Um, and this book was a little bit more expensive on Amazon than I was expecting it to be. So see if you can borrow a copy or if your library has a copy, if you're interested in doing 18th century. Uh, Sue Felshin's website is also on my short list, if, especially if you don't want to purchase a pattern. If you would like to purchase a pattern, I would say Mill Farm or Canics Corner are good places to start. And I believe that those are both something similar to the first cloak that I showed you, the one that I'm going to make uh, from Costume Close-Up. Um, and then moving into the 19th century, since Crystal had um, a question about linings in the 1850s, I don't know specifically about the 1850s. Uh, they might have been lined. The linings start happening as we get, we move forward in time. I would have to double check 
for the 1850s. 1850s is not my personal era, so I don't know off the top of my head. Um, but if you were doing Regency, I think in the Regency, they were still not lined. I can say that. Um, for 19th century, uh, truly Victorian or ageless patterns if you do not have a fear of using a period source. Ageless is literally a reprint of uh, of historical information. And so the sewing instructions are what was included with the patterns in the time. So if you if you have, if you were experienced in the 19th century, that might be a fun route to go. They have approximately 500,000 cape and cloak patterns. There's a ton of them. Uh, I did not include all of them. I got real tired of, of looking at them, to be honest, because there were just so many. Uh, there's all, they also have knitting and crochet, like capelet patterns, which was kind of cool and different. But they're fun to look at because they're the original illustrations and the original descriptions are also included. So like all the names, of the types of fabrics and trims and things like that. And so they're fun to look at, uh, but they're not, I think, for the faint of heart. Uh, and then in the early 20th century, if you're doing history bounding or... Um, or want just something more vintage styled, there's a lot of options. There's a ton of options. Uh, Decades of Style is was my number one pick for that because they have multi-sized print and PDF patterns. Lady Marlowe is another one and she has printed patterns and some of them are multi-sized and some of them are single-sized. Uh, I'm not really sure how she makes those decisions, uh, but uh, that is the other one that I'm going to be making, and I'll show you in a little bit. And then uh, Mrs. Depew is another good uh, resource, but she also has a lot of uh, information from the time, which is sometimes a little bit scanty if you are not an experienced sewist. So... I have uh, a 1920s booklet for Mrs. Depew that has two styles and one has like a lot of instructions and information and one of them is just sort of like an add a collar and that's it. And they don't tell you how to do that. Uh, if you're doing earlier than the 18th century, if you're doing medieval or early modern patterns, uh, Margot Anderson has a men's cloak pattern, uh, and she has good patterns. Patterns of Fashion 3 has, I think, six or seven cloaks in them. They're all based on circles. All of these are based on circles. Uh, and then there is a YouTube video from Knight Errant. That's Knight with a Y and not an I. Uh, and he talks specifically about how to make a reproduction of uh, uh, an extant cloak, the Boxton Man cloak. And at some point I will be, there should be a cloak along playlist on the YouTube channel. I think you guys should be able to see that. And then I'm just sort of adding things to it as I find them. Uh, but he does a really good job of explaining how to make the cloak and uh, some of the finer details that I think are important. And... Um, let's see, just checking. Cool. Fantasy based and nerdy. I love it. That's great. Elba Ros Elba Rosaria. Sorry, I just want to make sure I said that. Correct. Did you mean Instagram? For Knight Errant, uh, Rebecca, on, um, there's a YouTube playlist on my channel and uh, his video is on there and it's Knight Errant. He might be on Instagram too, actually. Um, collection of Cloak Along resources. Uh, the Cloak Along resources will be on Instagram. They'll be on... Okay, maybe it's not live. I'll double check the playlist uh, uh, and make sure that you guys can find it. And then... 
Uh, the cloak along resources will be on Instagram. They'll be on, if you're on my email list, they'll be coming through there. I'm hoping to be adding it also to the blog uh, because links are kind of hard to share on, <laughs> on Instagram. Uh, so I, I will be figuring all of that out and I'll let you, I'll let you know. So if you're on Instagram or you're on my email list or both, uh, I will be, uh, I will collate something and then give you a definitive answer on find it here. There we go. Um, fabrics. I'm just going to show up some of the fabrics that I have in stock. Uh, some of them I'll be using and some of them, uh, some of them I won't this round, but maybe next round. So I'm going to be using black uh, wool velvet, which might not show up very well here because black velvet does not show up well anywhere. Um, but it's really, it's a black hole. It's just a black hole. Um, but I don't think I'm going to need to hem this fabric. So one of the really fun things about the fold wool that I mentioned yesterday is that you also don't have to hem it. It doesn't fray, which is amazing. And uh, historically, a lot of cloaks were not, they weren't hemmed. They just sort of cut them off where they needed them to be. And that was it. Um, so this will actually do that, which is cool because um, there's a lot of hemming in there. But I also have some smaller pieces. So you can kind of see a little bit more detail, maybe. Yeah, the broadcloth from Burnley and Trowbridge won't need to be hemmed either. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, that is a good resource for that. But this is the raspberry. So it has a little bit of a sheen. It has some texture. And it doesn't need to be hemmed, which is cool see. Nope. No fraying, which is cool. Yeah. Um, what else? I guess I should show you the other pattern I'm doing because then this will make more sense. So this is the other one. So I'm going to hand sew my 18th century one and I'm going to machine sew this one. Um, this was, I've wanted this cloak forever. I've been eyeing this pattern forever and ever and ever. And then I finally decided to get it. And then, and then I think the cloak along just sort of took off and people were interested. I think that's what happened. So this is also my slightly more complicated pattern. There's like, there's a shawl collar and there's shoulder pads. And the 1940s did some really interesting things as far as style lines. Like you get yokes and things that look like graduation gowns to me anyway. But they also started doing this thing where they like chopped the shoulders off. I don't know if you can see it, but they like cut the shoulders off. So the shoulders are like a completely separate piece. Um, so there'll be like some light tailoring that I, tailoring is not my forte, but I will be doing some of it, I think, in this. And then I'll share my journey. And I'll be making that in the this emerald green cotton velvet, which is going to pick up tons of lint, but I think it's going to be really pretty. Were purple or orange ever used in the 1770s? Probably. Um, I, not probably. Uh, most cloaks were probably not orange or purple, um, though there was... Um, yeah, uh, red was very popular in the late 18th century, but it was not exclusively the only color. There was black and gray were also very popular, especially for men's cloaks. And I think there were a few other colors, like, um, probably more like tan and more neutral, like won't show lots of dirt kinds of colors. Yeah, um, I actually picked the black wool velvet because I found I found information and uh, reference somewhere to black, specifically black wool velvet cloaks having a, a little bit of a thing 
in England, but it didn't translate to the colonies. And now I can't find that information anywhere. So Rebecca, if you've seen it somewhere, let me know because I've been trying to find this information again so that I can make sure that I'm, I, I have a source for it because I remember seeing it and then I can't, now I can't find it. Um, and it's been driving me nuts. Um, what else? Silks, taffeta for nicer. Um, uh, for nicer cloaks, uh, not as durable in weather, but uh, silk taffetas were also used. Uh, they were also used for linings. Silks and linens and other wools were also used for linings in the 18th century. Uh, I'm using a modern rayon dress lining for the uh, 40s, for the 40s version. Um, and most historically, I think most cloaks, at least in the 18th century, were secured with ribbons or tape at the neck um, and not fancy clasps. Somebody did ask about attaching cloak clasps. So and I forgot to order black ribbon. So uh, I will be using a cloak clasp on mine temporarily anyway. Um Patterns of Time has apparently 15 pages of cloak clasps if you are interested in adding a clasp to yours. Um, it is essentially a decorative like hook and eye. Uh, you can also use a fur hook, uh, which would be easy to hide under a ribbon if you wanted something uh, a little more stable. And you can usually find those at, at Joann's. They usually come in like neutral kinds of colors. Um, yes, the Lars Daughter, uh, website is amazing for information and they, and, uh, they have collections of extants for like each style. Uh, it's amazing. It's really great. And what else do we need to talk about? Oh, there were some questions that people had about uh, related to fabrics. Someone asked about wool alternatives. If you have a wool allergy that might have similar properties to wool as far as like uh, temperature regulation and keeping you warm while, uh, while it's wet, uh, which is one of the amazing things that wool does. And uh, alpaca <laughs> is my number one but it's, it can be expensive. And I had a hard time finding, I didn't do an in-depth full rabbit hole last night, but I wanted to just see what was out there before I decided to answer the question. But um, alpaca is a little bit easier to find in yarn form if you're knitting something than in yard goods form. And I found some, but they were also kind of expensive, like starting at $120 a yard expensive. But that was also from the place that I knew was going to be expensive and I knew that I would find it. Um, cashmere or mohair might also be a good alternative. Um, mohair definitely existed in the 18th century. Cashmere, I think, would have been very expensive. Um, cashmere is also going to be, I mean, cashmere and mohair are both also going to be very expensive. Um, most of what I found was blends that were still at least 50% wool, which was kind of annoying. Um, another option that I thought I would be able to find more easily was acrylic. Uh, it's a synthetic, but it has been used in wool blends and has been used as a substitute for wool for many years and uh, is not uh, it's not going to be as warm uh, and it's not going to be as warm while wet as uh, an animal based fiber is going to be another option that was I found that I didn't think of was cotton flannel, which might make a decently warm cloak, but it's going to be terrible if it gets wet. Um, you're just going to be wearing a big, heavy, wet blanket, and that's not going to be great. Uh, faux fur could also be an option. Um, 
it was definitely used as trim. So you might be able to use possibly a wool fabric and fully line it and use some faux fur trim to keep the wool off of your skin. Uh, I don't have a great answer for that because the options that are going to function the same way that wool is, is go are going to be very expensive. Uh, I think my, depending on your allergy level, my answer is going to be if you can stand some wool to use a wool blend that has maybe the smallest amount of wool that you can find and fully line it. It's potentially not historically accurate to fully line it, but um, your health and well-being comes before historical accuracy. So if you need to make concessions so that you can be healthy, I think you should do that. Um, and then someone was asking about warm weather options. Uh, and my suggestions from for that are going to be lightweight wool, like a tropical weight wool, or or using cotton. Uh, I think it was was it last it was last week or the week before, but I posted on the Instagram a um, a really beautiful cloak from Provence in France that is made from a printed cotton, and I believe there's at least one other printed cotton extant. Uh, so that could be a choice as well. Uh, lightweight wool is probably going to regulate your temperature a little bit more and potentially feel a little bit lighter. Um, what else? What other things was I going to talk about? I talked about that. I talked about that. Um, thread, since I think, I think several, we had a mix of hand sewing and machine sewing. Um, but my wool, um, my wool cloak, I'm going to sew with silk thread and this is just Guterman's silk thread. I brought the red cause it's a little easier to see. Um, but wool was commonly sewn with silk in the 18th century. I don't think wool, wool, wool thread. I don't think was ever really a thing. I think I put that on one of the posts. Oh, Kate says there's also uh, a Regency-ish extant that is also made of cotton chins. I don't know. I think we were talking about that. I'll have to send you the picture and you'll have to tell me if that's the one you were thinking that you're thinking of. And what else? What else? What else? What else? So some things that uh, I'm definitely going to go over during the cloak along is is hoods, which was the second most asked question <laughs> um, for the cloak along, just different hood shapes, um, how to draft them, how to do the pleats in the 18th century hood, how to, um, I think, I think... Kate is actually going to be maybe doing something on detachable hoods. I know you've made one, but um, a lot of earlier time periods, even in the 18th century, uh, a lot of hoods were detachable. So it's basically just a hood attached to a collar that you could wear over or under your cloak, depending on the weather, and wasn't actually attached to the cloak. They're a separate piece. Um and uh, what else? Uh, there'll be uh, uh, some tutorials on how to draft your own pattern if you want to make uh, your own. And what else? I wrote down my notes last night while I was um, also trying to get off of the computer before I had to go to bed because it will keep me up. If I'm like, go from my computer to trying to sleep, I will, won't be able to sleep. So I was trying to get off my computer, but also wanted to make these notes. So there'll be um, a bunch of information, different types of hoods. I will talk about different ways of drafting patterns. I will probably do a video on how to get the pattern from costume close-up out of the book because it's not gridded. And I think that throws people off. Um, and uh, what other things? Uh, one of these special announcements is that Kate, who you can find at Hacking Historical, 
has challenged herself to make approximately a cloak a week for the duration of the cloak along, which is a lot of cloaks. And I think she's going to be making videos and um, uh, she's going to be making videos and potentially have some pattern downloads and things for you if you wanted to uh, make your own similar style, but she'll be talking about a bunch of different things. So I'm very excited for her to do that. And I'm just going to like skim through the comments. I've been kind of trying to keep my eye on them, but I'm going to skim through the comments and see if there's any other questions. So if anyone has any questions or comments, um, throw them in there. Separate hoods. Let's see. Regency. Um... Awesome. Okay, I got those. Camlet. Camlet is a wool, as a style of fabric that you can use for a cloak. Um, I think Burnley and Trowbridge sometimes has something that they call Camlet. I don't have anything that would be Camlet. Um, but I think that's my next textile term. Uh, chintz cloaks. Cool. Uh, Krista. Oh, I think I was calling you Crystal and you're Krista. I'm sorry. Um, Silk thread, the Guterman silk thread should work in your machine. I would test it. Oh, and Rebecca uses it in the machine. Oh, there you go. You guys have already, you guys have already uh, answered my, answered the questions. Cool. Yeah, I've, um, there are other brands of silk thread that may or may not work uh, as well in your machine, but the Guterman's I think is, designed to go into your machine. Um, cool. I think I've answered all of the questions that I've seen. Well, how many yards do you recommend? Okay. Just trying to find the question. Um, I have a uh, the wool velvet that I'm using for the 18th century cloak, I have like a off cut remnant piece that's about two and three quarters yards. And it's that fabric is 55 to 60 inches wide. So it's wide. Actually, it's 60 inches wide. I know it's 60 inches wide. Um, and I am going to make that work however, however it fits. Um, and yes, and I redrew the pattern a little bit and I'll talk about how I did that. Um, cool. Yeah. I think that I don't know how to translate that from meters to yards. You're probably better at that than I am, but that's what I'm using. And, uh, I'm making adjustments from there because that's what I have. Um, where's the pattern piece? I'm adjusting how the pattern is going to be cut, and I'll probably talk more about that when I make the official video um, to sort of do what they did, where the center square is essentially um, the width of the fabric, and then they just sort of cut extra pieces to fill out that half circle shape uh, just to limit limit piecing. But I think that's all I have for right now. Um, if there's any other questions, you can always DM me or comment on Instagram or email me. You can always respond to the emails from the email list. That makes it easy. There's also a contact page on the website, but um, I think that's all I have. Yes. 
Right. Um, Rebecca says, because with broadcloth, you can um, butt the seams together and sew them that way without a seam allowance because you don't need to hem them because they don't fray, uh, which is super fun. All right, everyone. I think that's all I have. Um, and then uh, I will be adding captions and doing timestamps for different topics of discussion. And that should be um, yes, arm slits. I think I'm going to be moving mine. I'm going to mark them and put it on and see where they are because I'm also very small and extending my fabric is wider than theirs. Uh, so I might be moving my arm slits, but I'll, I think I'm going to talk more about that when I do the pattern, my pattern video. Um, all right. That's all I have. Um, if you have questions again, you can DM or comment or, um, uh, or use a contact form or email me. And I'm so excited. I'm excited that we have a range of time periods. I'm excited that so many people are into this. Um, we're like, I don't know, it's like the ultimate cloak cult. It's great. I love it. Um, so there'll be more. Uh, I'll be, uh, there'll be a Pinterest board and there'll be, uh, I'll find the YouTube playlist and, um, yeah, and if you have, if there's more specific questions, let me know. Uh, there's, I think there's lots of, there's a range of uh, skills, uh, people who are, are newer and people who have some more uh, experience in historical sewing will be joining in. Just, it's so cool. I'm so glad you guys are all here. This is going to be great. So I will see you later. Thank you for joining me. And uh I'll let you all know when the replay is up in case you want to revisit anything and uh, all the lives for the cloak along. I'll do that for all of them so that you can always find information in the future if you need it. So cool. Bye everyone. Thank you for coming. I'll see you soon.